Hello, everybody. I'm Professor Chris Davis. This is my colleague, Dr. John Raza. And in a partnership with Spessart Associates, we've developed an electronic home plate for baseball, which will allow the referee, umpire, or scorekeeper to tell whether a ball is a ball or a strike. And the device is here visible to my right. It looks like an ordinary baseball home plate. But it uses light scattering when a ball crosses the home plate the ball intersects some invisible infrared light from light-emitting diodes, and the signals that we get allow us to determine not just the lateral position of the ball, but the height of the ball and the speed of the ball. And furthermore, this device will tell whether a batter has failed to check their swing, which of course also corresponds to it being called as a strike. And we can even turn on this device, which spins a ball above the plate, to show you how we test the device for different speed balls. So if John will just activate this, but this is a spinning device. When it gets up to speed, this ball is mimicking the speed of a 30 mile an hour ball. We're not gonna turn it up to a 100 mile an hour fast ball because it would be frighteningly fast. So we've decided not to do that for this particular short demonstration. I'm now going to show you what the data looks like coming from the electronic home plate. We're going to show you a picture of an oscilloscope which shows the signals from the three photodetectors. And you'll be able to see in this simple picture the two peaks in each of those traces that shows the ball passing through the first curtain of infrared light and then through the second curtain of infrared light. And the spacing between the peaks is what tells us the speed of the ball. So you can see that the peaks move further apart as the ball got slower. Send it back up to 30 miles an hour, John. So this is the electronic home plate. There's a curtain of invisible light coming up vertically through these two slots. And there are three photodetectors that detect the light scattered from a baseball as it goes across the plate. If I take the cover off, you can see the inner workings of this device. There's a line of light emitting diodes here, and there's a line of light emitting diodes here that emit very intense, eye safe infrared light. And there are three photodetectors. And the rest of what you can see is the electronics. There's a miniature radio in there for communicating the observations to an external person. And we're hoping that this eventually will be marketed as a tool for the training of baseball pitchers. And then later on, we're hoping to have an inexpensive version available for Little League Baseball, which will help amateur umpires determine balls and strikes, and we hope prevent fights among parents at Little League Baseball games, because there will be no debate about whether a ball is a ball or a strike, because some lights will flash whenever the ball is a strike. So, I'm Alison Plato, professor in the Aerospace Engineering Department, and I'm Song Minna. Um, I'm uh, Assistant research scientists, they're working in the aerospace engineering. And together we've been working on an alloy that's mostly iron, but has enough additional treatment to it that it behaves as a very good sensor. Yeah. The, these sensors are really important for detection of a phenomenon called scour that's responsible for over 57% of the bridge failures in the U.S. There's a lot of damage associated with this problem. You can cost effectively go in and mitigate scour fairly inexpensively if you catch it early, but when major scour has occurred, you end up needing to replace bridges. There's downtime associated with loss of use of the bridge. There's downtime associated with uh, construction of uh, components of the bridge. Uh, so scour itself is a huge economic impact on society. What we want to do is turn this block of material into something that resembles whiskers on animals. We're, we're focused right now on taking advantage of the sensitivity that animals have with these long, thin strips for understanding about their environment, for us to use in an application. When scour happens, that soil moves away, and we need a flow sensor to detect flow in the region where it shouldn't be that is robust enough to work after having been buried for five years, 10 years. But this is our whisker. We have this one for uh, performing underwater. Uh, the one in my hand right now is, is more going for plant-inspired, and so that's our tulip-like whisker. And, uh, 
it, it, it's uh, very sensitive to airflow. So I can just sit here and whereas this one, we need more force to deflect. So the idea is to put these on a, basically attach them to a post that we can bury underground when high velocity waters flow past the soils that the sensors are buried in, they pick up and redeposit that soil further downstream, leaving not only the bridge foundation exposed, but our sensors exposed to water. And as water flows past our sensor, because it's magnetic material, when the sensor wiggles, the magnetic state changes. Here is a prototype that we've built. This setup is all hooked up. We've got four whiskers on this post and, and, and uh, I'll just wiggle the one on my side here and you can see a pretty clear signal in response to motion. They're, they're all hooked up and so depending on which, wig, which sensor I wiggle, you see the, the dynamic response to the load that we will anticipate flow producing. We have wires that run to shore and wirelessly transmit that information to the bridge owner to alert them that what should be buried is no longer buried. Hi, my name is uh, Don DeVoe. I am a professor of mechanical engineering uh, with uh, affiliate appointments in bioengineering and chemical and biomolecular engineering uh, in the Clark School. And um, it is uh, uh, my pleasure to talk about the invention that we have uh, developed in my group uh, called the, the Maryland MEMS and Microfluidics Laboratory um, uh, in a new microfabrication technology for thermoplastic systems. And so we, we, uh, we term the base technology uh, orogenic microfabrication. Uh, and it's a, it's a new technique that allows us to do uh, microscale and nanoscale patterning of rigid thermoplastic materials um, without using photolithography. So the approach that we've taken is uh, entirely different. Instead of removing material, we have developed a method that allows us to grow features from the thermoplastic substrate. So uh, the technology allows us uh, to pattern the surface using very simple methods like inkjet deposition or spotting methods, or even techniques as simple as taking a pen and drawing on the surface with a pen to create a masking layer. Uh, then what we can do is expose the surface with the mask uh, features to, a, uh, to an appropriate solvent. And what we've shown is that by selecting the correct solvent for a given thermoplastic, that we can raise structures out of the thermoplastic. All right, so here is an example of um, a very basic um, patterning uh, technique uh, for, for masking the thermoplastic substrate, which we're using a commercially available pen plotter that costs uh, roughly between like 50 to $100 to um, pattern the masking features that we want on a thermoplastic substrate. Applications uh, for, uh, for this technology are, are fairly broad. Um, the technique uh, has uh, potential applications in the energy field. For example, making uh, uh, micro-patterning surfaces uh, of thermoplastics to render them super hydrophobic. Uh, and, and by doing this, we can create self-cleaning uh, surfaces for uh, solar panels, for example. Uh, one of the areas that we're very interested in applying the technology is in healthcare. So a lot of the work that we do in my lab is based on microfluidic technology for, uh, for example, diagnostic applications, making uh, small-scale disposable devices for, uh, for medical diagnostics. And so this uh, orogenic technique allows us to make sealed microchannels uh, in thermoplastic substrates in a very, very low-cost manner uh, that uh, can be done essentially from idea to device in about half an hour. So we can take what used to take uh, uh, many days, maybe even a week, uh, to make a photolithographic mask, perform photolithographic patterning, uh, etching or otherwise patterning the, uh, the thermoplastic surface, uh, and then sealing that device. We can now do that entire process in about half an hour uh, from the initial, original uh, concept uh, for the, the microfluidic device.